Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Welcome to AutoLine After Hours. As you can tell, we're not in the studio today. We're up in northern Michigan, Traverse City to be precise, at the management briefing seminars. And I've got Gary Vasilash, my co-host here with us. And i got to introduce our two guests for today's show, too. Sitting right next to me is Andrew Lund, Chief Engineer at Product Development at Toyota. Great to have you on the show here, Thank Andrew. You. And Jeffrey Stout is uh, with Research Technology and New Mobility at Young Fung, mm-hmm. and uh, some of you may not recognize that name. If you haven't, it was part of Johnson Controls, Controls International before that. Correct. But Jeffrey, great having you here on the Thanks, show John. too. Appreciate it. And uh, how do we start the show, Gary? What do we start talking about? Well, I mean, I think the thing is, is that Toyota yesterday rolled out with a hydrogen-powered Class Eight semi truck, and I uh, think you should. Tell us a little bit about what was and, going and let me interject that. because it's it's not a Toyota truck. It was a Kenworth, right? Well, the chassis, the frame was a Kenworth. We purchased yeah. a Kenworth frame and then we modified it uh, with uh, hydrogen fuel cells from the Toyota Mirai, and uh, we basically then added electric motor and the batteries. What we have is a 670 horsepower semi that uses hydrogen as its fuel and only emits water. It can, it can do everything that a semi could do without the, uh, you know, the pollution that comes with the diesel engine. So, Andrew, give us a little bit of the background, why you did this truck and where it's being used or will be used. Right. So, uh, we have been working with the Port of L.A. and the Port of Long Beach for uh, a while. Uh, we introduced our Alpha truck uh, last year, and for about a year now, our Alpha truck has been running routes through uh, drayage, which drayage is unloading a container from a ship and shipping it out to the rail yards. We've been doing that for about a year. And when you say Alpha truck, it's also a fuel cell. You mean it's It's the first one you ever did? It's the first truck we did. And then then this, the one we unveiled yesterday is we're calling the Beta truck. It's our second vehicle with a a, a few more improvements. But yeah, we've we've been doing it for a year, uh, gathering data, what went well, what what we need to improve. And then the Beta truck shows a little bit of improvement. That's what Toyota does. You know, you've heard of Kaizen, continuous improvement. That's what we do. we make step-by-step improvements. So the second one we could say is, is more commercially viable, and so we can study uh, more about uh, the, the potential future. So Andy, do you, do you look, I mean, so the first one was purely drayage, and it was just you know, moving stock back and forth within, within a set area. Now, given the range of this one, it's like 300 miles? 300 miles, yeah. Okay, are you looking at the possibility of having this being used for long-haul trucking? Well. Our main focus right now is really to help the LA area and the drayage. Um, and explain that. There, why, there, why, there, why is the port a problem? Or so, the ports? Yeah, so right now the LA area around the ports is an area of high pollution. Because you've got all those trucks and all those ships. And... All those ships. And, and actually, you know, there's more business opportunity for the ports to unload more containers. But they can't necessarily expand because there's a pollution issue. So we have an opportunity to help the ports grow. And we have an opportunity to help the, you know, the children that are literally playing soccer right next to that area. They can breathe better air uh, once we get more and more of these trucks on the road. And that's what we want to do. And we will we'll partner with a variety of companies. You know, Shell is making hydrogen stations in the area to help us. Uh, air Liquide is, uh, manages the hydrogen uh, infrastructure with us. So uh, with their support, um, we think that we can make an impact. But we're just studying, learning, and that's what we do. So, so does hydrogen as a fuel have viability for passenger cars or light vehicles of, of any sort? Yeah, sure. Uh, Toyota um, already has 3,600 Mirai sedans on the road in California. Uh, and there are, I think, 35 uh, hydrogen stations in operation today. And there are more being built. So we can see the light duty uh, vehicle market grow slowly. 
And we think that maybe once we turn the corner in the 2020s, we'll see a little bit more exponential growth where we might be able to grow that market to 30,000 or more. Um, and certainly we think that uh, the Mirai is a great vehicle. Uh, we're proud of it. It, it, it drives well. It has 80% of the um, market right now for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Uh, and we want to grow that for sure. But uh, a heavy duty truck is really uh, another application because if you consider the amount of consumption, fuel consumption that a light duty vehicle does, well a heavy duty truck consumes 40, 40 times more. So if you consider, we, we could convert 40 light duty vehicles or one heavy duty truck and get the same consumption, same impact, you can, see, you can see how it multiplies very quickly that there's an opportunity to do something really magical for this community by looking at specifically at the, um, the, the dray edge trucking. You mentioned that you have been running this Alpha truck and that you know, you're studying, what'd you learn from that? What, what, did, uh, what did the truck teach you? Well, I mean, we, we had a, a, a mileage of 200 miles was what we had targeted and we did that for the Alpha truck. You know, the average drayage operation is about 200 miles a day. So it made sense that, well, you could fill up once a day and you could do your run. But we, we learned by, you know, operating the truck that sometimes you don't necessarily want to fill up that morning or that evening. You want some operational flexibility. So we added a little more range just to make it easier for our, uh, our uh, operations. And we're partnering with Southern Counties Express. They're a company that actually hauls freight for Toyota. So we are actually helping them help us to do that job cleaner. Uh, and what we learned that you know, 300 miles is, is a, maybe a little bit more uh, better, a little better for um, the drayage operation. And then other things, like the first vehicle was really just like we took two Mirais and literally took two Mirais and mashed them into uh, a heavy duty truck. So the accelerator pedal on the Alpha is like the small pedal that you would have on the um, Mirai because we didn't want to mess with the, you know, the accelerometer, uh, the accelerator positioning and, and how it reacts. But you know, that's not really so suitable for a truck uh, driver operation. So I mean, we, we did some of the ergonomic improvements to give it a full size pedal, the shifting location. So those type of improvements as well. Uh, and then more range. You also took a bunch of weight out of it. Yeah, yeah we, we basically just optimized uh, bit by bit by looking at areas. For example, the first one, we took two sets of wire harnesses from the Mirai, and we put them in, in, in there. And there's a lot of wire har wires that were not being used. Well, this time we cut and spliced, optimized, took some weight out there. Just efficiency in the way we package the, the um, various components, we were able to take weight out. So, so you took about a ton out, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking to splicing wires. You yeah. took a ton out. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll continue. There's more opportunity. And when we look to the future, if we, if we continue down this path, there's more opportunity to take more weight out. So why hydrogen and not batteries? I mean, we're seeing you know, Tesla announced that they're going to have an electric semi, and Nikola is, is doing an electric semi, and I think uh, didn't come Crate liner. Like, and, you know, I mean, every, everybody's showing electric, and you guys are doing hydrogen. Why? Well, to, to be uh, truthful, I mean, battery and hydrogen both have a place in the market. Uh, and we at Toyota, we, we develop battery technology and we have battery electric vehicles being planned. Um, and actually quite a few will be rolled out in China and then throughout the world by Toyota over the next uh, few years. Uh, so we're not saying battery's not good, but battery has its limitations. It has its limitations in range and charging time and weight. So there are going to be some applications where it's better to have uh, onboard energy storage in the form of hydrogen versus onboard storage in the form of uh, electricity. So we, we look at this holistically, looking at the market from small vehicles to mid-sized vehicles to large vehicles, going from short range to long range. Um, you know, what is the vehicle doing at night? Is it running 24-7? If it's running 24-7, when do you have time to recharge? Or is it just a delivery truck where it's only going to deliver items during the day and it's going to sit with no one driving it all night long? Well, those type of uses will make battery or hydrogen fuel cell maybe more attractive. So, um, but for the drainage operation where you need to be able to keep the running going and there is a third shift, you know, not all the terminals operate the third shift, but there is a third shift, so you might need to be there early in the morning. Uh, having that flexibility of not having to charge uh, is something that really works well. And you're able to refuel within minutes rather than within hours. Sure, I mean, we're working right now with, uh, with you know, the hydrogen protocol of, how, of the refueling times, but certainly, 
it, you can refuel while you wait rather than have to plug it in and go take a, an afternoon siesta or a, a, a long siesta or, or you know, sleep at night. So. What I find fascinating, too, is Toyota owns a Hino, big heavy truck maker. Why didn't you use a Hino truck? Why go with a Kenworth? Well, I mean, Hino is a great company. They're a partner company. Um, their focus in North America has really been on Class 6 trucks. Uh, they do very well in the Class 6 market. I think uh, close to 10 or 11% of the market share. Uh, and so certainly uh, they are also working towards ZEV, and we, we will support them in their activity. But our application right here was immediate need in Class 8 trucks. And so, so we took a Class 8 truck that was on the market, like a Kenworth. It's a high-quality vehicle. Uh, so we use that as our, our mule to convert. Uh, going forward, I mean, we'll, we'll look at a variety of different options and uh, can't say much more than that. Has Kenworth given you a call and say, hey guys, we like what you're doing, uh, let's talk? Well, I mean, Kenworth, you know, is, is a great company. Uh, they've also unveiled their own hydrogen fuel cell uh, vehicle. Uh, it's been um, uh, at the port as well. Uh, certainly, um, we have had a conversation. They know that we use their Kenworth truck. Uh, but beyond that, I can't say much more. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, we're at this conference here, and, and a lot of the discussion is, is about the future and what will be happening. I mean, do you see hydrogen playing an increasingly important role as we go forward in the auto industry? Or will it plateau at a certain level and, and not have that much impact? I mean, where do you see it going? Um, I think it's going to have continued growth. And then when we get to the tipping point of the con scale of econ economies of scale, then I think we'll see the exponential growth. Mm -hmm. you know, if you look back to the days when uh, Toyota introduced the Prius hybrid, there was a time when people were like, hybrid, what's that? You know, why do we have hybrids? We should just go with uh, you know, ele electric vehicles. Hybrid will have no place. Well, flash forward to today, almost every automaker has hybrid, and at Toyota, you know, we're committed that to uh, that we'll have every single vehicle, Toyota or Lexus, in the lineup will have some form of electrified power uh, in the near future, I think 2025. So certainly there's a possibility here uh, of that type of exponential growth where right now people are saying, like, why hydrogen? But, but, but you know, in a few, and when we introduced the Prius, it was only the Prius, right? The hybrid was the Prius. And it was a popular model. You know, Brad Pitt drove it to uh, one of the award ceremonies, and people were like, well, if Brad Pitt drives one, I want one. So then people started wanting to drive it. And then it became kind of a, a fashion vehicle. But now that same drivetrain, I mean, the hybrid, we have it in all you know, vehicles, or many of the vehicles, we have it in the Camry or the Highlander. So right now, the hydrogen fuel cell is only available in the Toyota Mirai. You know. But in the future, who knows what, what other vehicle lineups it could go in. Um, but we, it needs to go together. Right, right now in California, we have a golden opportunity. or uh, it's, 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 an, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, but it's also an opportunity because there's a need uh, for uh, clean energy. Um, that has motivated the whole state of California to really focus on it. Um, and it, when you have motivated um, consumers and support from infrastructure and the technology, we can say that we have the technology. Well, when those things, three things line up, well, then you can move forward. Yeah. So that infrastructure then will, will continue, we believe. For example, uh, already I think in Northeast, uh, there's 12 hydrogen stations being planned in the Northeast. The first one in Boston will come online later this year. So we can see that, okay, California formed a little nucleus, it started to grow, and others said, well, well if California is doing it, and then and there's interest there, the reality is there's a need beyond California. There's a need in various locations. And once you have success, success breeds more success. And so I think it will grow. And when we get to that tipping point where the total cost of ownership uh, becomes on par with internal combustion engines, then it'll really go fast. So here we are in northern Michigan, okay, and it gets really cold up here during the winter. Would a Mirai work up here? A Mirai will work if we have the hydrogen station infrastructure. Um, certainly do that. And, and I, I believe the MEDC has plans uh, on that front as well. So um, you know, the, the, the market here in Michigan, years from now, might be, look a lot different than it is today. You know, that's a great point because in the wintertime, you can lose up to half your range with a battery electric. And I, I, I'm guessing from what you're saying, wintertime would not affect the range or the performance of a fuel cell. Um, the energy is stored in hydrogen form. And the battery is really 
temporarily holding the power to transfer it. So, yeah. Um, so a hydrogen car is an electric car. It just uses hydrogen as the fuel rather than right. using stored energy right. in a battery as right. the yeah. source. So if, if you think about the, the process of, of electromotivation, either, some way you need to generate electricity. So if you have a battery electric vehicle, you're just storing electricity that someone else generated somewhere. Now, we don't know what they did. Was it a, was it a nuclear power plant? Was it a coal burning power plant? Or was it wind power? Or was it you know, solar power? Certainly wind power and solar power are very renewable, wonderful ways to do it. But we might not have enough capacity to meet all the needs. So then you have to generate that electricity somehow. Hydrogen can be used to generate offboard or onboard. So it becomes a very clean uh, way of generating uh, electricity. And we are developing a station, a uh, tri-gen uh, hydrogen developing station in California, where we will be able to supply our um, TLS operations with electricity, as well as generate hydrogen that we can use to power our vehicles. So uh, yeah, you can generate electricity, and that, um, that hydrogen is actually made from um, agricultural waste from California. So we are not even adding anything to these um, emissions in the generation of the hydrogen. It's already, it's waste that would already evaporate on its own. We're just taking it and using it to generate uh, hydrogen or make hydrogen. With the hydrogen, now we can generate electricity and we can take some of that hydrogen, put it on board a vehicle and generate electricity locally, right, using the fuel cell. Is that scalable, though? Because as you know, most hydrogen right now is made from reformulating uh, sure. oil into gasoline sure. and other fuels. Sure. Yeah, I mean, to the degree of it being 100% um, clean, we have to see how we can form hydrogen. Uh, there's a lot of ways that uh, hydrogen is formed today. Uh, it's a byproduct, so it's, it's a readily available in the refining business, so that's one way. Uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a byproduct that's already been generated, then you're not really adding anything more to capture it. So that's one way to say we're not adding to it, we're just capturing uh, what might otherwise be blown off into the atmosphere. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, Anheuser-Busch has talked about creating these truck stops that would generate the hydrogen right there instead of having to transport it. Does that make sense to you? Um, yeah, it, it, it all depends on really the, the total cost, right? So. You know, transporting any item has a cost, and, but then, you know, making that energy locally has a cost. Mm -hmm. So I think the market will determine what is the optimized um, location. If we look at, for example, even like a home energy use, you know, the traditional way is that you, you would have all your electric power would come from the power station. Maybe DTE would have a power station. They would supply it quite a few miles to your house and then you would, you would consume it. Well, even some of the, um, the uh, utilities are considering, is that the future or should we have local stations making electricity locally and transporting it at a shorter distance because then you have less loss of, of uh, energy loss. You know? I mean, electri electricity is very e easy to use, but it's hard to store and it's hard to send a long way without some loss. Right. Okay. Jeff Stout, you've been sitting here nice and quiet and everything. I know you look at the big picture, too. What do you think? Hydrogen, yes or no? Uh, I think I agree. Uh, it'll have a place. Um, our expectations is that it's going to have a smaller place, uh, that the amount of inertia that's behind the investments associated with full electrification make that kind of the dominant player moving forward. Um, but at the end of the day, we operate in an environment that enjoys experimentation. It enjoys the sense of, well, give that a shot. Let's try a fuel cell. Let's try on natural gas. Does, does that have a place? Um, and as things get tried, the society that we live in, there's winners and losers. And in the end, the consumer finally makes the decision of what's going to end up being there. Our personal opinion inside of YF, though, is that uh, we think electrification has the investment behind it that's going to make that a sig more significant player than the hydrogen or fuel cell mm -hmm. in the near term. Yeah. And I would imagine it... You you guys work on interiors of cars. It yeah. doesn't matter what's on exactly. the hood, really. That's the honest it, it, answer is yeah, I don't yeah. care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it honestly doesn't matter to us one way or the other. We're agnostic. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, what do, you, what do you both think about the future of the internal combustion engine? Does it have one? I think it absolutely has one. At a minimum, um, there's going to be a desire to have the sound and the feel of an internal combustion engine. For enthusiasts, For yeah. enthusiasts and... 
And the enthusiast, I think, goes down quite deep uh, in terms of the people who would want that. It's not just the uh, multi-million uh, millionaire enthusiast. Um, but it's only a question of whether it's niche or niche with some level of mainstream. Um, but in the end, it's going to keep getting eaten away. But the internal combustion engine has been challenged for decades that we say, ah, it, but it keeps improving and keeps improving. And so never count out uh, a technology's desire to remain relevant. So it'll continue to try to maintain a place in society. And Andrew, as you point out, hybrid's still very viable and they all use internal combustion engines. Well, I mean, if you have a hybrid and if you extend the uh, fuel economy of an internal combustion engine, and that's a step in the right direction, right? I mean, we talk about zero emission vehicles, Zev, but we also talk about near zero. Right. So a any movement is good that helps. And there is, there is going to be a certain amount of interest in uh, you know, people wanting to drive a vehicle. Um, but some of the races today, I mean, electric vehicles might be the, the, the way, the you know, uh, Formula One in the future, uh, we could see. Well, we can Certainly, argue that, yeah. but first we got to take a commercial break before we get to that <laughs> oh, argument. Great. So we'll be back in just a moment. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. Okay, we're back with Andy Lund from Toyota and Jeff Stout from Yang Fung. And this is the part of the show where Dr. Data gives us a number. All right, so it's going to be very easy. Projected 2018 shipments, 540,000. Shipments, pure electric, battery electric vehicle shipments? All right. That sounds high to okay, me. That sounds high. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll give you a clue. 540,000 shipments. shipments. Shipments is an interesting uh, yeah. word right. there. So just keep that in mind. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll you're, guess. You're going to um, guess before the clue? you got to uh, guess before the okay. clue. Let's guess before the all clue. Right. I'm going to guess um, drone shipments uh, of packages. Ooh, that's not bad. <laughs> that's very interesting, but wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. we get a clue. All right, you get the clue. And the clue is... All right, so of the shipments... 80% of these are produced in Indiana, of which 60% are oh, wow. in Elkhart County. County. Elkhart County gives it away, right? Yeah, That's right. RVs. RVs, right. Shipments of RVs. And you are absolutely correct. So recreational vehicles. So it's interesting that approximately 10 million U.S. households have a recreational vehicle. And that's according to the well, some, of, some of them are up here at the uh, right. Seminar. See, and so, so this was this was sort of like a vacation themed number. <laughs> All right. See, but so I knew I knew that Elkhart was going to just just like giving away, and uh, um, you know I, I. So there we go. That so was five hundred and forty thousand. I believe that's got to be a really good number, right? Oh yeah, they're I, I very the, happy. The, yeah. Their their business is booming. Mm -hmm. So as we as we could see when we were driving seventy five north to get up here, lots right. of RVs. So that's what people our age do. The trendy thing for the young people is to buy an old yellow school bus, yeah. strip it out, and outfit it as an RV. How many of those get produced would be an interesting question. That'll be your next show. Yeah, that, that might boost it to a million. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, I mean, mentioning ripping up interiors, I mean, so what is it that you guys see as, as trends and developments as, as vehicles move forward into this, this automated, connected, shared world? Uh, so we see dramatic change coming, um, for sure in the near term. Um, if you look back 20 years, maybe that's where you have to start, and look at the 20-year curve, we work in the space of instrument panels, door panels, all of the trim that you have on the inside of your car. The stuff that was in the inside of the car 20 years ago versus today fundamentally is the exact same thing. It's better, it's lighter, it's more efficient, etc. but it's all incremental improvements over those 20 years. What we see looking forward to the next 20 years, and 
it's going to start happening far before that, but it becomes kind of mainstream in that time frame, is a re-looking at the entire use case of that interior. As you move into connected, and there's a bunch of different acronyms, right? Whether it's ACES or CASE or SA. We haven't gotten to the point where we formalized down to one acronym. Um, when you get into that space, you start having dedicated interiors for a use case that doesn't exist today. Today, when you take an Uber, for example, a guy shows up in a Toyota Prius, I'll use Toyota as an example since I have my colleague next to me. Um, that car was built for someone to buy and use as their personal vehicle, and it's been repurposed to have me ride in the back seat and they take me where I need to go. In the future, as this becomes autonomous um, and it's connected and that delivery uh, is of me as a person or of packages, I can now have dedicated interiors that are intended for that use case scenario. So what does that look like becomes the question that we spend a significant amount of time thinking about and looking at, um, but in the end, it looks very different than what it is today. So it's just so, have vinyl seats like a cab. It's not going to be that, <laughs> would it be our perception. Now there may be a case for that where you have, um, in the presentation yesterday, if you had a chance to see uh, the gentleman from Rivian, AJ, talking about the bifurcation of use case scenarios where you'll have a fully commoditized, hey, how do I have the lowest cost, most simple delivery mechanism? That use case will exist. But there'll also be a, how do I get a person to their job in the morning and I want to have some level of luxury associated with that, but also functionality that I want to be able to get online, I want to be able to use my laptop. A school bus, delivery of children to schools, delivery of packages, taking people to the club at the end of the night. Those interiors will either need to be dedicated to that vehicle or reconfigurable inside that in vehicle through those different use cases. And what that drives for us is a, getting back to the conversation about fuel cell versus electric, that carriage of the vehicle will still last the same as it does today, but the interior is going to be going through so many different uh, use cases during its life, you'll wear out the interior far sooner than you'll wear out the rest of the vehicle. So now suddenly you've got these reuse scenarios of having to redo the interior during the life of the vehicle, and that's all made possible once the vehicle is being operated from a mobility as a service standpoint and not an owner parking the car in the garage. Now people are buying vehicles in mass and servicing those vehicles in mass and that opens up all kinds of possibilities of dedicated use case scenarios for the interior. Jeff, are you looking at ways of quickly converting an interior because if it's going to get used that much with shared mobility, the seat covers are going to wear out, the carpeting is going to get frayed and all that and today, as you know, it's a pain in the neck to have to disassemble the entire vehicle and reassemble it. Correct. Um, so the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, the second answer would be, well, how do you do that? And one of the things that, and you kind of alluded to it, that we think is really interesting, over the history of the interior world relative to end of life, we have customers ask us all the time of, is there something we can do at the end of life? And the reality is, there's no business case for it. Because at the end of the life, if the car goes to the junkyard, all the valuables get stripped out of it, it then goes to a shredder, all of the ferrous metals gets pulled away, and you're left with this bundle of fluff. ASR gets called automotive shredder residue, yeah. and it just gets bundled up and put in a landfill. Right. And the reality is there's no good way to remove that from the, uh, the stream. In this case scenario where I'm constantly updating the interior, I now have a mechanism to remove the existing simply and quickly and put in a new interior. Well, what do I do with that old interior? We have the ability to reprocess those interiors. Mm -hmm. There's just no way today to get it to the reprocessor. Well, now suddenly I have a mechanism to remove it from the vehicle. I do now have a mechanism to get it to the reprocessor. We will see in the future a closed loop stream of materials that never goes to the landfill. It'll get used, removed, reprocessed, Re-put in the vehicle. It will, as long as it's cheaper or at the same price as virgin material. Absolutely. And that's why all the ferrous metal gets recycled, because exactly. there's a willing market to pay for it. Absolutely. So what will be interesting as we look at uh, the breakout of these new, today we talk about ride share, car share, and many people don't even know what uh, that language is referring to. We start to break it out in terms of uh, the time spent in the car. There's a, there's a use case where you're in that car for minutes, I need to go around the corner to the, whatever, to the bar, whatever, or hours where I'm commuting to work every day, or years where it, what we have today and what we've had for the last hundred years, nothing new there. And as you break that out relative to the consumer research that we do, we find that it's really interesting that the, the answers to the questions become different. What does it mean when people say, and globally this is true, everybody is concerned with safety. Well, safety when I buy a car means when it gets in an accident, I want to make sure my family is safe. When I'm taking a ride chair or a minute's ride, I'm not really thinking about if I get in an accident, will it be safe? I'm thinking about 
who was the last person who was in this vehicle and did they leave something behind that I don't want? Is there a chance that I could actually get into trouble here? The, the questions are completely different. Um, personal security. For my car, again, I want to know that it's safe. When I'm getting into a car that's a, a minute's ride, I want to know that it's clean. That the hygiene of that car, when I open the door, it's going to smell nice and it's going to be nice. So what the mobility service providers and us as interior suppliers need to manage to make sure that that use case is satisfied. So what technologies are needed in order to make sure that that interior is always clean, always functional, predictably functional, that I can know in advance, yeah, this thing is starting to wear out. I need to take that vehicle offline, swap out that part, get it back online, get it back on the road. I once interviewed a designer, a crazy guy named Luigi Colani. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not, but he said, you know, if you had never seen a car in your life before and you came upon it and you peered in the window, you wouldn't understand anything about the interior. The belts, the headrests, the armrests, the knobs, the levers. He said, you wouldn't understand anything of it. Whereas if you had never seen a bird's nest before and right. you looked at it, you would know exactly what it's to intuitive. do. Go inside and curl up. So using that kind of analogy or vision, where can you take interiors? Uh, so I love the analogy, and you're absolutely right. So when we work with our designers, especially our young designers, and you say, hey, configure an interior that you would want if you were going to get into a car for minutes. And then the images that they create are amazingly compelling and unrecognizable as an automotive space. It looks like a cafe. It looks like a place that you would be drawn into either in isolation where you want to have privacy or in a sense of community where you're kind of exposed to other people. And it's like, that, that's not how we have conceived our cars to be. And the way we have conceived our cars is fundamentally dictated by engineering requirements, FMVSS, and all cars have very strong design limitations at this point in order to satisfy all those rules. In a world where you don't have a driver and that restriction is removed, what you will see in the interior literally will be unrecognizable to what you see in every single interior of a vehicle in the world today. So, we were talking earlier about whether hydrogen replaces gasoline, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, are you looking at a future that is going to be sooner or a future that will be later for this to happen? Our opinion is that it will be sooner. Um, if you look at uh, name dropping books, I guess Clay Christensen, Innovator's Dilemma, any industry that's going through a time of disruption always goes through a period of um, denial. That uh, It's just another disruption. We've been talking disruptions for the last 50 years. They never come. Um, this is one that is coming. Um, if you look at the work that's happening with new mobility customers, the amount of investment dollars that are flowing into this space is not flowing there because the people want to waste their money. It's flowing into the space because there are really smart people who know that there is going to be a new business model based on new mobility patterns, based on collecting data and using data to drive the business model that makes it worth, this is coming and it's coming fast. If you look at, um, I guess Waymo is the most uh, kind of advanced as far as getting this on the road. They're not talking about having level five autonomy by 2030. It, it's right now. It's on the road. Yeah. Um, and when you talk to people about that, there's always this kind of background denial of, well, yeah, but it's just a beta test. Uh, no, they bought 60,000 Pacificas. They're very public about it. They've bought 20,000 Jaguars. They're not buying those cars I don't have any inside information that you don't have, by the way, just as a note. Um, they're not buying those cars to put them in a parking lot. They're buying those cars because they're going to do something with them on the public roads right now, starting right now. And so the sense of, well, is this a 2025 or a 2040? It's not going to dominate the market in 2025, but it's already starting in 2018 that you're going to start seeing it. And by the time you get to 2030, if you haven't already made the planted the seeds for your company, whether it's Toyota or Yamfung, to be able to manage that transition, you're in trouble. So speaking of new business models, one of the things that a uh, number of automakers have talked about as far as uh, uh, ride hailing goes mm -hmm. is being able to haul passengers during the day and packages at night Correct. and reconfigure the interior. So uh, yeah, I got to believe you're looking at doing this. And what I'm wondering is, do you come up with too much of a compromise? It's not that great for hauling pa packages mm -hmm. and maybe not that comfortable for passengers, or can you accommodate both? 
I would say, again, there's probably going to be a split or fork in that road of you're going to have one vehicle that's low-end transportation, blow-molded plastic seats, if I want to just pick on an example, something that's very easy to remove and run packages, and then just real rudimentary transportation. But there will be a vehicle that says, I want to have some level of luxury connectivity. What brings me to the office might be the same car that takes you and your wife to the opera. Um, there'll be some shared use case there in a scenario there. Having kind of a luxurious vehicle that gets completely reconfigured to deliver packages, that probably isn't uh, the way it will move forward. Interesting. Andy, you were about to say? Well, th there are several different trends that we've been talking about, right? Ride sharing is one of them. Um, so when you look at ride sharing, what you mentioned is that the, the, the preferred seat is changing. When, when, when we were kids, right, and, and you would yell shotgun because yeah. everyone wanted to ride in the passenger seat. The passenger seat was the second best seat in the car. In the car, Maybe the first uh, best seat if you didn't want to be the driver. Well, now it, it, there are vehicles where the second row seat is better. For example, the Sienna minivan, which I used to be the chief engineer of. Mm -hmm. People, people know that the second row is where you want to go. So the people that run to the front seat, other people are like, ha he doesn't Let know. <laughs> We're going to the second row seat. That's where I can recline and be comfortable. So, you know, and, and if we look at limousines, right? Limousine is another area. Or a taxi cab in Japan, which has white, white cloth. Mm -hmm. Very, everyone knows the second row seat is where you want to be. And the third person has to, oh, okay, I'll go up in the passenger seat. So we, we see that uh, capability is already there. And that will increase with ride sharing. But then ride sharing, that also becomes a personal vehicle, so for the driver's seat also needs to be comfortable when they use it for their own personal reasons, but then they need to be able to have the seat slide forward and really give their customer second row. So that's one of the trends. And the, the second trend we talked about is autonomous. And autonomous, the growth of how quickly autonomous will come really depends on some of the infrastructure and the technology that needs to come. Um, so at Toyota, we're investing in uh, artificial intelligence because we know that we just can't yeah, put something out there that won't really protect our, our customers and our users. So we need our artificial intelligence, intelligence to be better. It's an area that uh, TRI is working on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also you know, need to make sure that the, um, the technology is slowly rolled out. So for example, you know, there's still going to be scenes where the human reaction is just amazing. The human brain is an amazing miracle where we can see things that we've never seen before never seen before, and somehow make a logical reaction yeah. to it. And then the computer would be winding and winding and winding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that type of artificial intelligence is necessary. But what can really help is really the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle type of infrastructure. So if, if your vehicle knows that around the corner there's an accident, it starts slowing down long before the human eye can see it, that will be able to supplement some of the, um, the other uh, drawbacks that artificial intelligence might have. So, we see infrastructure needing to improve. We see the technology needing to improve. So you know, at, at the rate in which we can improve will be the rate that it really becomes widely adopted. Mm -hmm. If we look back to ABS brakes, remember when ABS brakes were just coming out and there were some people that says, I'll never drive a vehicle with ABS All brakes. All the enthusiasts, yeah, you know, exactly. I can, I can brake better than that. I can that. pump the brakes better Faster than, than ABS can. brakes, yeah. right? And they truly believed it. Well, today, I don't think anyone says that today. They just know that, you know, ABS, you just put it down, the vehicle will do it. So it took a while for the public to realize that this technology is better than what the humans can do. And it took a while for that, them to come to that. Um, autonomous driving can get to that point but we need to prove it uh, with technology, right. and we need to have the infrastructure to help support that so that, business, that case is made. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you for vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, but I don't think we need a whole lot of infrastructure, only because Waymo has already racked up eight million miles out on existing roads today and without any of that infrastructure. To me, that's the icing on the cake, though. Right. Yeah. And, but I think we can, you know, start this move and it has in fact already started. Yeah. Well, at Toyota, we have vehicles on the road collecting data. Sure. So we, we, know, we know what works and we know what doesn't work so well. Yeah. And we'll keep working, working the solution. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the interesting points, just to top off that, as far as the drive for, well, why would you? What, technology doesn't get adopted for the sake of technology. There's a, there's a market, a consumer pull for that. And we see two things. Number one, from an autonomous standpoint, if you look at any cost study associated with, if I can provide autonomous ride share, I, I can reduce the cost per mile of that ride by close to 50%. Well, as soon as that ride becomes that much more affordable, I can amortize the investment that's required to make the car autonomous um, and have a financial motivation to do so. Secondly, one of the more fascinating things for me personally that I've seen is from an adoption curve standpoint, 
the young people love it, ride share, I get it, uh, autonomous would be wonderful. The second largest group is elderly. And it's like, what? They're, they're not early adopters, what's going on there? Um, and as you interview people, you realize that there's this sense of a fear of loss of mobility. And if this enables me to be able to very easily have a user interface, a single click that a car picks me up and takes me where I want to go, now it doesn't, I don't have to have that argument with my children of whether grandpa needs to lose his license or not. Take my license, I don't care. I can go wherever I want. Once that you know, critical mass happens of that rideshare capability, it enables, frankly, quality of life issues for elderly uh, folks to be able to still live. Oh yeah, no, it opens up uh, mobility for all segments of Correct. society. Not just the elderly, the very young, anybody very young. with a disability. Disabilities, absolutely, know. blind. So <laughs> to me, that's the, the big societal benefit for Correct. this move. Everybody can have mobility now, not just those who are 16 are or older with a driver's right. license. Exactly. But does, doesn't this completely disrupt the YF business in the Toyota business? Because basically, you're talking about elderly young people they don't need to own a car if they don't need to own a car they don't buy a car correct and and so what is what is the big metric in the auto industry you know how many sales will there be this year how many sales will there be next year and and this seems to run counter to that basically saying okay you know we'll use one vehicle for a number of purposes mm -hmm. deliveries people short mm -hmm. long so on and so forth i mean what happens well, if, if, if ride sharing becomes more and more popular, there, there will be a shift. But if we consider, if, if the population has the same amount of mobility, then the miles transported will be the same. Right. The, the question is, rather than use two vehicles to drive 100,000 miles, now two people might use one vehicle to drive 100,000 miles. So therefore, those two people will be using that vehicle twice as fast and therefore, that vehicle will need to be replaced, perhaps at a higher rate. And so there, there will be an adjustment in the market, but it's not necessarily that, oh, because th you know, there were five people that own their vehicle and now they're all ride sharing, therefore it won't only be one vehicle. It, the math doesn't go five to one. There's going to be a, a higher turno turnover of the vehicle. So we'll see where the math turns out, but there will be an adjustment, but we'll see. Okay, we got to continue this uh, line of discussion because this is a really good one, but yet we've got to take another commercial break. We'll be back right after this. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back talking about all kinds of things. Fuel cell trucks, the new way interiors are going to get designed, but we, we left off at the break saying that these vehicles are going to get worn out a lot faster. I wonder, will not fleets want vehicles that last longer? And, you know, the analogy I like to use is the London cab, mm -hmm. purpose-built ride-sharing vehicle. Mm -hmm. And guess what? 40% of the London cabs right now today are 10 to 20 years old. So they've clearly been designed to last a lot longer and or get refurbished a lot more quickly. So Andy, I wonder what your thoughts are. How, how hard would it be to take instead of 150,000 mile durability for a vehicle as a target, take it to a million miles like the class eight guys do? Well, it, it's just a different spec, and therefore you engineer it differently. Um, it, it'll have its own set of challenges, so I, it's hypothetical. It's hard, hard for me to yeah. know what we would do, yeah. but certainly uh, you can go longer. I mean, recently Toyota bought back a Tundra that had driven one million miles. So the, the person had driven him for one million miles, and we were like, well, we want that truck. And, <laughs> and he said, I don't want to give it to you. And so, but anyway, he was kind enough. We, we bought it back, and we gave him a new... Uh, so one truck. owner? One owner, a million miles. Um, someone, right. someone drove a Sienna for 300,000 miles. Um, so, yeah, the vehicles can last, but not maybe in every use, right? It, it, if you have a, like a Siennas or sometimes in New York on the city taxis, you'll, you'll see the taxis... Um, and that's a harsh environment, a lot, of, a lot of braking, a lot of transmission, and they'll wear out quicker. Now, if you want to design for that environment, well, we're engineers, so we'll find a way, uh, but there will be a cost that comes with that. You know? right. So you have, you have to optimize the vehicle for its performance and its cost for the user 
and how they intend to use it. Mm -hmm. If it's a single owner that's going to drive the vehicle X amount of miles a day, that's a different uh, user than an industrial setting where, like you mentioned Class A trucks, well, yeah, they drive a million miles of just hard miles of mm -hmm. not constantly driving. So. Yeah, and uh, Jeff, I wonder uh, how you see it, because if I look at airplanes, mm -hmm. you know, they have a 20 to 30 year life. I mean, the B-52 bombers are all older than anybody <laughs> that's in there flying them. Correct. And all they do is update it. Could we see cars go along the, that route? Where the, the basic chassis and body remains essentially the same and you just upgrade it. Absolutely, so uh, there's been articles written about the million mile vehicle. We expect that's going to become normal, that the body itself the battery, the motors, the, the chassis will last a million miles, but the interior is not going to last a million miles. We have a pretty strong opinion that as we look at uh, where a mobility service provider's value lies, they don't necessarily view themselves as being the interior uh, maintainer, if you will. And so when you say, well, they want the interior to be more robust, we think the answer is they won't care they'll care holistically, but they won't care in that it won't be their business. They will outsource that to somebody to own the interior of the vehicle to make sure that it is always clean and always functional. And so whether that breaks every day or whether it breaks once a year, they won't care because there will be somebody else who will care. So whoever owns the responsibility for that interior will have the responsibility to make sure that you design the right parts with the right level of robustness and you have the ability to sense when things are starting to wear out that it can be replaced affordably, efficiently, so that, at the end of the day, the metric that's going to matter to the mobility provider is vehicle on road. That vehicle, like an airplane, if that airplane can't fly, it can't make money. And the last thing they want is for a dirty interior to keep that plane out of the sky. So somebody is responsible for that. Rolls-Royce has this model with the engines. The robustness of that engine is Rolls-Royce's problem. So if there's ever an issue, they own the maintenance, they own the service of it. If the plane doesn't fly, they receive the penalty. That's the model we think that the interiors is going to go down. The owner of that fleet is going to outsource the responsibility to make sure it's always clean and always functional. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, you know, you were mentioning the Waymo buying the Pacificas and former chief engineer of the Sienna. Okay, and so it seems to me that the minivan has, has long been a type of vehicle that has not been quite as successful as it might have been. Um, yeah. I get the sense that going forward that the minivan may actually have a renaissance, that that may be the type of vehicle that could be used for car sharing or ride hailing or whatever you want to call it. So, I mean, d does that make you feel encouraged? And, <laughs> does yeah, that give, and, and does that give you a broader opportunity of things to do on the interior of a vehicle? So I would say yes, if I could go first, in that... This gets back to the conversation of when the car shows up at the curb, do I care if it's a Toyota Prius or not? Probably not. The theme of that exterior, what excites me today when I see a, choose whatever you want, a Maserati that's in, oh, that's so beautiful. That, for a rideshare experience, becomes irrelevant. So the biggest criticism about the minivan is what it says about you. You're a soccer mom, you're midlife, you're, you're boring or whatever <laughs> adjective you want to put on there. If it's a rideshare, all of those adjectives become irrelevant. Those don't describe me. I just called the car and this is the car that came. Now, the minivan had a useful life because it has amazing utility. The size and shape of that vehicle allows you to do so much inside the car. We think a vehicle with that generic proportion is where this will go. You'll see less and less of the sedan small vehicle because that, again, is stylish. And st exterior styling becomes less and less important and interior functionality becomes more and more important. Well, I think uh, a minivan is very versatile. So versatility really plays a role when you look at how many vehicles are in the family. Now in America, where a household has two vehicles, you know, one of them can be a minivan, it's a utility vehicle. The other one's probably going to be either a fun vehicle, like a sports car, or maybe a, a small vehicle that has uh, really good uh, miles per gallon. So you can choose that. If we look at ride sharing, even today, Uber, you can, you can choose what you want. You can have the luxury vehicle, or you can have the, the low cost vehicle, or you can have, you have a lot of people in your party, you can have the large vehicle. So you can choose. So the minivan can have a role. Um, and if we look at the minivan trend that you mentioned, you know, it, it had its heyday in the 80s when it was over a million. But that was because it was being purchased for multiple reasons. One of the reasons was three row seats. Second reason was because the size. That was the size that you needed to be able to pack all your sons and take them to college. And the third reason was because it has sliding doors. And 
So then as sport utilities came in, there were other three row options. So people that were only buying vans because they wanted a three row option, well now they, they have other options. I can buy an SUV if I want. And if I'm gonna, if I want better snow clearance, maybe that's the vehicle I'm gonna choose. And so those people left the market and they bought the SUV. And then you look at the size of the vehicle. Well, the size of the vehicle, you know, now we have large SUVs where you could have the same size or nearly the same size. Um, and if you don't mind the worst fuel economy, then some of those people went and bought that vehicle. But the people that wanted the sliding doors because they don't want their kids to ding, mm -hmm. those are the people that will buy a minivan over and over again. So the market, you know, went down to about 500,000. It's back on a rise now, back up closer to 600,000, I think growing with the market, um, holding its market share. Um, because it has a truly uh, unique uh, value that the market needs. I think ride sharing um, just basically gives more options. So now there will be some vans, there will be some SUVs, um, there will be some luxury vehicles because you know you might want to look go to the prime in style. You don't want to show up in a in econo box of some type. So there will be an opportunity for more vehicles and they won't all be industrial looking. There will be some very beautiful vehicles. For sure. um, and I think some people are still going to want to own their vehicles because the joy of driving is that some people like to do. Um, you know, and, and vans, vans certainly have that image of being like, okay, this is a soccer mom or a hockey mom vehicle. But we challenged that at Toyota when we introduced the Toyota SE, the sports edition. And the take rate grew to 10%. 10% of our, of our take rate was sport editions. So we exported a little bit more. We entered the, um, the Siena in the one lap of America in 2016. <laughs> and and we, we modified it, um, but we didn't add any power, right? So we didn't want to cheat by adding power. We just improved the suspension, made it a little bit tighter, and we won, our truck, we won the truck class with that van by not adding any more power. So that's kind of a fun way to show that, hey, you know what, it's, they can be cool. So I drive a Sienna today because it's, frankly, it's the coolest vehicle and the most versatile vehicle. Um, and everyone calls me when, when it's time to go out. They go like, okay, yeah, I like my, my, my sports car, but oh, Andy, can you take me? Let's go out, let's go out. And they want to get in my van, so. You know, I didn't know you were chief engineer on the Sienna, but I got to tell you, because I've told everybody this, the best riding experience is that second row seat. Right. And you've got an option with a foot rest too. So I can recline the whole thing. I've got two armrests. I got a giant sliding door making it easy to get in and out of. And I got this big video screen in front of me. It, it's the best ride. It's better than any limousine. Yeah, the, and that sliding door, you know, we made it bigger as part of our uh, way to address the mobility market. You know, we, we learned through the spirit of Kaizen, so our first- And when you're using our, mobility, in this case, with people with some sort of physical yes, handicap. Yes, yes, So, you know, there are aftermarket converters that take our van, and they, they drop the floor so wheelchairs can come in. Well, they're the ones that told us on our second generation Sienna that they have to jury-rig the sliding door to open it more because there's not enough space. So on our third generation, we said, well, we can help with that. We, we just made the sliding door open bigger so that when the aftermarket is, is making their vehicles available for people that are you know, in wheelchairs, it can be more user friendly for them. And you know, going back to your comment too of autonomous vehicles and ride sharing do not have to be industrial looking. Check out Rolls Royce's vision for a level five car. For sure. It's drop dead gorgeous. Right. It, you would love to pull up into an Academy Awards uh, you know, event or any kind of fancy restaurant or in that kind of a vehicle. Right. It, it's stunning. I, I think that Brad Pitt will pull up to the next Academy <laughs> Award in, in the- uh, In the, the No, the big rig, the oh, uh, yeah. hydrogen powered right. uh, class eight. Hey, that's that the other thing statement. we didn't talk about because I was there when you guys rolled up the truck yesterday. It's the first time I've ever seen a Class 8 semi roll up making no, no noise. noise at all. Just a I slight wish... whirl of the, of the motor, right? Exactly right. And man, you know, we, we talk about uh, air pollution all the time. Noise pollution is another big pet peeve of mine, and that would go a long way to solving a huge part of it. There's no doubt. The, the, the drivers that are driving our vehicle, uh, the Alpha, and will be driving the Beta around the ports of uh, LA and Long Beach, they, they give us feedback, and they, they love the fact that they can turn on you know, ignition on, mm -hmm. turn the system on, and they don't get jerked. Right. You know, they, can, they can basically accelerate without all the shift shock. It's actually better for the drivers and then they don't hear that noise just rumbling. They'll pull up to a light and then another truck will pull up next to them and look and say, 
oh, there's no stack on that vehicle. Right. It's not making any noise, you know, and then they, then they realize a little insignia that this is a, a fuel cell vehicle, and that's usually when they give the thumbs up. So I think the community will be very welcoming. What about acceleration? Because, you know, I've driven on, so is Gary, all the electric cars, and that's what we love about them. Instant, yeah. instant torque, yeah. right. It's got to be true in your truck. Oh, absolutely. We have a video online. If you, if you look it up, you'll see it, where we, we took a standard Class 8 diesel truck and a standard, in, in our Alpha truck, and we, we put them you know, uh, driver accelerate, and uh, the alpha is much faster, no doubt. I mean, you get that uh, torque, that torque right. at low RPM, yeah, wonderful. Can you lay a patch? <laughs> um, I've never seen a class eight semi lay a patch. That would it. be awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A little disclaimer, closed course, professional yeah, drivers, drivers do, not, do not try this at home. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's great. Jeff, you, you're, you're talking about big disruption hitting yes. this industry. There's several studies out there that see uh, car sales falling off a cliff. Correct. I mean, in a big way. By 2030, one study, another study, uh, Rethink X says by 2030, boom, this 95% industry is in. 95% of all miles driven in urban areas exactly. will be Exactly, uh, and then there was street. another one from Barclays that said probably around 2040. Right. Do you see that sort of thing happening? We do. We think Rethink X is a little bit on the optimistic side, um, but it's interesting as you see that scale. Um, we've stopped arguing about if, and now we're in an argument about when, and the argument about when is getting into the about a 10-year window. The conservative folks say it's really disruptive in 2040. The more aggressive people say 2025 to 2030. At some point, from our perspective, it does, there's no real tangible difference between those two numbers. So whether you're skeptical or you're optimistic or uh, aggressive, at the end of the day, this new world order is coming, how do you get ready today for whether it's 2025, 2030, or 2040, and what does that look like? And for a tier one, and I would argue for automakers the same, there has to be an appreciation for, we all have significant amount of installed capital. We all have a, a desire to defend that capital and have productivity off of that capital. And when there's a change that makes that capital obsolete, you have a choice. You can either fight that change and say, well, no, I'm going to try to keep the industry utilizing my capital, or I'm going to abandon that capital and start getting on the next set of tracks to the next uh, future state. And that's a difficult transition for any company to make. And it's going to differ by company because I imagine if you make tires and brakes and windshield wipers, the future looks great because yep. VMT, the vehicle miles as traveled, is going to expand. So and interiors where you got to rip it out and replace it. But uh, Andy, what do you say? Do you, do you think this is uh, a world that we're heading into or not? Well, I, I think uh, at Toyota, we are basically going to be flexible for anything that comes. Um, we're not so ready to jump on any bandwagon. Um, we've seen bad wagons not become bad exactly. wagons in the past. For sure. So, um, you know, but you, you need, need, do need to be flexible. Uh, if we consider, um, you know, the, the trend from trucks, to, uh, from sedans to trucks, then we, we have our manufacturing plants being flexible so that we can make more trucks and more SUVs. Um, at the same time, we're not ready to say sed sedans are dead. Um, there's, we have some great sedans and some of our customers absolutely love them. Uh, and we think that the, they, they'll, they'll be a place for those. Um, so, but we need to be flexible because the market could turn on a dime very quickly. And so you know, our global production engineering system is based on flexibility in our manufacturing. And we'll continue to design that flexibility into our manufacturing processes so that we can be proactive and be ahead of the curve when the, when the market is shifting. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Andy used an important word. He said global. Mm -hmm. So does the change start here or does this change really catalyze somewhere else in the world? Great question. Um, the, I would argue the change began here. Um, it was ideated here. But as far as implementation, we're seeing a couple of significant trends. In Europe, um, inner, city, inner city areas are very quickly becoming car-free zones where they say, hey, we don't want you driving your personal car through the city. How far and how fast that goes, uh, Oslo is pretty famous for saying it was going to be car-free. And then they said, well, no, we're just going to eliminate parking, which kind of does the same thing, uh, just a, a different way. And we're seeing that in many different European cities. Uh, in China, relative to pollution, certainly the move to electric will happen far faster than it happens in the U.S. Uh, the distance traveled is much farther in the U.S., in cities, outside of cities. Um, for sure, the electrification will happen there. The autonomous part, our experience is that in China, there's a much 
quicker embracing of technology if they feel like it advances societal good. Um, and so they're willing to take risks that we collectively, from a legislative standpoint, want to go a little more step by step. So we think that they probably are going to be more quick on the early adoption, but in the end, we really see it as a global phenomenon. It's really happening in all three major regions, the US, Europe, and China. In 20 years, it won't matter. It'll all be It'll there. all happen. Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, we have to wrap this discussion up. You guys have been terrific. It's been a real pleasure having the both of you on the show, you. and you've really stimulated my <laughs> thinking here, too. So. And Gary, always great to have you here. And uh, we have next week off, I believe, is that right? Or are I'm we back in the studio? <laughs> Hope so. But okay. I, <laughs> well, figure that out. Figure it out. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll figure One it out. One way or another. But anyway, we want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.